Father God, we settle our hearts before you. We thank you for your word. We hope Stephen hit the record button when he left. And Lord, we sure thank you for the fellowship we have as saints. Lord, how we pray for our country. Lord, I pray for our president that he would come to a true saving knowledge. That his cabinet would experience the true presence of God. And that, Lord, we might be surprised by what you've done through answered prayer. Lord, we pray for our country that it would turn back from foolishness, wickedness, and selfishness. And it would come back to you. Lord, may we seek you first as a country. Lord, I pray for revival among the churches and an awakening among the lost. Lord, we don't know how you'll do it. You don't need our advice. But we ask that you would move powerfully in this year in our country in a way we haven't seen in a long, long time. Take your word now and open it to our hearts and change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. That's as far as the Neil go tonight. Chapter 11. And it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, had heard those things. What things? That Israel's blowing through the southern part of Canaan like a hurricane, right? Leaving the, you did hit record, didn't you? All right, excellent. Why, thank you. Fantastic. Don't worry, I won't try to get you all motion sick while I circle and circle and follow the green dot. Came to pass when Jabin king of Hazor had heard those things that he sent to Joab king of Madon and to the king of Shimron and to the king of Akshaph to the kings that were on the north of the mountains and of the plains and the south of Chinnereth. Chinnereth, by the way, is also known as Kinnereth. Kinnereth means a harp. In the Greek, it's translated to Gennesaret. What body of water are we talking about? Sea of Galilee. The reason Kinnereth or Gennesaret is because it says shape of the harp. And I don't know if you can see it real well up here, but what's the shape of this? A harp. And if you get up on the Golan Heights, you can look down and see the harp shape of the Sea of Galilee. And so it was called the Kinnereth or the Chinnereth or the the Gennesaret. Then it would later be Sea of Galilee, because it's in the Galilee, Re- Galilee region. Then it would be Sea of Tiberias, in honor of Tiberius Caesar. So the name that it is given depends on the time period that you're reading. So if you find it's changing in your Gospels, they're not crazy. They're just trying to tell you the time period that they're referring to it. But on the plains of the south of Chinnereth, in the valley and on the borders of Dor on the west, and to the Canaanite on the east and on the west, and to the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Jebusite in the mountains, and to the Hivite under Hermon in the land of Mitzpah. And they went out, they and all their hosts with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore for multitude. Now Josephus, how he gets his numbers, we really don't know, so you take it with a grain of salt. He claims they had 300,000 fighting men. He claimed they had 10,000 horses and 20,000 chariots. That sounds a bit excessive, but there is a very large host, as we're told in verse 4, like the sand of the sea from multitude. That's a lot of folks. Horses and chariots, very many. Now, if you don't realize this, chariots, you might think, well, it's a wooden buggy on wheels. Yes. But they would put iron spikes around it, and often they would take a sigh, you know, the kind of half moon shape, like the Grim Reaper thing, sigh or sickle, and they would sharpen those up, put them on poles, and put them all along the side. So the thing looked like a kind of a big prickly urchin, so to speak. And then they just run them through the enemy ranks. And they're like a tank. They go through and they cut and they wound and they maim people. So they blow the chariots through first to soften up the opposition. And then the foot soldiers follow after. So if you're just guy on, guys on foot with swords and spears and shields, it's a formidable thing to face. These guys are loaded with chariots. This is, this is extreme advantage on their behalf. When all these kings met together... They came and they pitched at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. Again, in that northern... No, I don't have it. It's kind of a northern area. Merom, to fight against Israel. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them. <laughs> Wait, we're going to go up there with our spears, our swords, and our shields, and these guys got a large host of chariots. How many might be a little put off by that? 
Watch what they do. Be not afraid of them. For tomorrow about this time will I deliver them. Now see the large red arrow there on the map? That journey to get up from Gilgal is about a five-day march. So for them to hear that on the next day, God's going to deliver them into their hands, what does that mean? They're already en route. So it may well be their spies have come back from being on the advanced scouting teams there saying, hey, these guys are loaded to the gills with chariots and horses, man. This is, this is a whole different party than what we've been to before. And Joshua's going, uh uh-huh. And God gives them the encouragement, don't be afraid of them. Don't worry about it. This time tomorrow, you're going to have the upper hand. So what does he do? They press on even harder to get up to the location. So Joshua came. He said, listen, this time tomorrow, I deliver them up, all of them slain before Israel, but I have a request. God told them, you got to hew their horses. Listen, Chester County horse lovers, don't stone me, all right? What does it mean to hew a horse? You cut the rear legs, tendons, and main arteries. Obviously, they can't walk after that, and if you cut the arteries well enough, they will bleed out. In other words, destroy the horses. Why would God want them to destroy the horses? Too much to feed. They don't really know how to ride them. And why would he want them to destroy the chariots? We got over here, to depend on them. I don't want you taking horses and chariots and starting to depend on them. You know, in my mind, when I look at the battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39, and again, it'll be clear when it's history, but I get the perception from studying that battle that God intervenes in such a way that Israel realizes their technology is not what delivers them. It's the power of God. You know, how many of you saw that, that article, was it in what European leader where somebody came in and tried to shoot him point blank? How many saw the picture in the news? How many saw that? This guy comes up to a, a political leader, walks up to him, is about to shoot him point blank, and the gun failed. It's a, if you haven't seen it, look in, it's, it's, it's a shocking photo. Bulgaria. Thank you, Jerry. Bulgaria, where it happened in the news last week, and you want to talk about God overruling. We've got to remember there's the God factor in everything that happens, and he can shut things down easily. Destroy these things so you don't depend on them. So, verse 7, Joshua came, and all the people of war with him, Against them by the waters of Miriam, what does it say? Or Memram. What? Suddenly. And they fell upon them. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel. Question. Thousand something horses, however many chariots, and you're suddenly attacked. What are you probably not prepared for? What do you have to do to get a horse ready for battle? I don't think they're riding them bareback. You got to saddle them. What do you got to do to get a team on a chariot? Yoke them, saddle them, whatever you do, hook them up. So if you're suddenly attacked, how effective are the chariots? How many now get the picture? Joshua gets encouraged by the Lord. He's like, double time. And they pick up their speed and they come down on these guys before they have time to prepare their big, bad chariots. Now it's a more fair fight. I like it. So they came upon them suddenly. These guys are all fooling around trying to hook up horses while they're being attacked. And they fell upon them. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who smote them and chased them unto great Zidon. They started around here, and they took them all the way up into Tyre, Sidon. They just, man, and look, here's your mile. It's 20 miles. They started chasing them hard, and they had the upper hand. Chased them up unto Zidon and to Mizrifoth Maim, into the valley of Mitzpah eastward, and they smote them until they left none remaining. Now they wiped out all they could get their hands on. However, take a look at, let me make sure I got my reference here. Give me a second. It was clear as a bell when I looked at it earlier. Take a look at Judges chapter 1, that book I was in. Judges chapter 1. No, that's not what I wanted. Hazor. No. You guys hang out for a minute. Let me find out what I'm looking for. They will again come against Hazor 
So there are some who survive and they reform and it becomes a problem during the time of the judges. But I am not able to find right now what I am looking for. 127 maybe? Hold on, 127. 122 maybe it was. 27. Well, do yourself a favor. Go home later and look at chapter 1 and you'll find in Judges that these guys come back in another form, which means they wiped out everybody and get their hands on, but then they somehow were able to reform, come back. Well, we'll get it later. If I bump into it in my notes again, I'll give it to you. Sorry about that. We know in part, we prophesy in part, and I got the verse in part, so we'll have to get it later. Back to our chapter. So the Lord delivered them into their hands. They pursued them. And so verse 9, And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. He hewed their horses, steady horse lovers. He burnt their chariots with fire. And Joshua at that time turned back. You know, there's a, there's a message here. Do not use the enemy's methods to fight God's battles. I want you to get rid of the horses, get rid of the chariots. That's what the ungodly trust in. As David said, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the Lord our God, right? I don't want you to use the enemy's tactics or the, or the ungodly's tactics to achieve the work of God. Something the church ought to remember. Don't use worldly tactics when God wants to do it by his spirit. So he did what God told him. Wiped out the horses, burnt the chariots with fire. And Joshua at that time turned back and took Hazor and smote the king thereof with the sword. And Hazor before time was the head of all these kingdoms. And they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. But again, some did escape. Nor left any to breathe, but he burnt Hazor with fire. And all the cities of those kings and all the kings of them did Joshua take and smote them with the edge of the sword. And he utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. So everyone they could get their hands on, they wiped out. But as for the cities that stood still in their strength, Israel burned none of those except for Hazor only. That did Joshua burn. It is on a trade route here, Hazor, that runs up and goes into Damascus, runs up toward the north, and also eventually works its way down here and then heads over towards Babylon. It was a major trade route area. It was a key city to guard that southern approach to the northern range. And so to take that city out and destroy it was to send a message of how that Israel would deal with their enemies. And all the spoil of these cities and the cattle the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them. Neither left they any to breathe. As the Lord commanded Moses' his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. Question, why is Joshua having such great success? Because he's obeying God. How many got this? Okay, you know, in my quiet time, I'm in the book of Acts, even though I'm teaching it anyway on Tuesday mornings. Funny how that works. And here I am again with Paul, Peter, and John, and others are called before the Sanhedrin, and they say to him, God gives his Holy Spirit to those who obey him. Here they are, the guy who's been healed, they're doing miracles, and, everything. and when the Sanhedrin heard that man, they just wanted to kill him on the spot. But it is true. When we walk rightly with the Lord, we experience his power, we experience God's enabling, you know, and, and truth be told, there's great joy in it. There's great joy. Now look, does that mean we get everything right? No, I'm not saying we, you know, suddenly we become Puritans, we do nothing wrong and everything else. I'm not saying that. But when the general tenor of your life is you seek to handle others as you want to be handled and you seek to love others as you want to be loved, you seek to obey God as, as you know he would want you to do, you're not actively pursuing things you know are wrong. When we walk in just simple fellowship with God, saying no to the dumb things and just continually trying to seek after God, we find there's, there's you just find a contentment. Godliness, interesting, with contentment is, it's great gain. But if you're, if you're compromising as a believer, you're backslidden, you're in the stuff you shouldn't be, you, you really know you don't have freedom in this area, you really shouldn't be partaking of whatever it is, there's no peace in it, there's no real joy in it, you feel kind of like a second-class citizen among God's people because you think, boy, if these people really knew what I was compromising with, they'd be like, dude, get out of here. And, you, and you're, you're too much in Christ to enjoy whatever worldly thing you're hanging on to, and you're too much in the world to truly enjoy Christ. And you're stuck in the middle zone. And that's not where God wants us. God wants to do cool things through your life. It doesn't mean you're going to necessarily wipe out Hazor and Jabin and everybody else, but there may well be people around you that, that they're watching you like a hawk. And those, those little areas that you, you just kind of eh, fudge it. I don't really want to worry about it. I'm kind of have my little gray area. They're going, Dang. it's stumbling them. And yet you might, as you get just serious, Serious in your time with God. Serious in where your mind is, where your time, your, what your extracurricular activities are. 
As you begin to truly, as Jesus said, just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, suddenly God begins just to add all kinds of things. And a big part of that is just simple contentment and joy. Interesting, the secret of Joshua is he did what God told him. He walked in simple obedience. Our quiet times should speak to us, and we should seek to employ those things God has shown us in our lives. So did Joshua, verse 15. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. And Joshua took all the land of the hills, and all the south country, and all the land of Goshen, and the valley, and the plain, and the mountain of Israel, and the valley of the same, even from Mount Halak, that goeth unto Seir, southern Dead Sea area, Edomite area, unto Balgad in the valley of Lebanon, far up to the north unto Mount Hermon. And all the kings he took and smote them and slew them. And Joshua made war a long time with those kings. Caleb will tell us next week in chapter 14. He tells us that he was 40 years old when he entered the land. And now he's 85. Two years up to Mount Sinai, beginning the journey to Kadesh Barnea, they disobeyed 38 more years wandering. So most feel it was probably about seven years now that they've been trying to conquer the land. Others say, no, it seems more like five. But somewhere between five and seven years, with 600,000 fighting men, plus, of course, women and children, you know, some are still on the other side of the Jordan with Reuben, Manasseh, and Gad keeping their their families. But with this large host, they're working their way through and, and conquering this area. To give you an idea, just to to put against that backdrop, Alexander the Great, 30,000 footmen, I believe 5,000 cavalry or horsemen. Six years he conquered all the way into India and the surrounding areas. Within 12 years he had conquered pretty much what is his known world with just 35,000 total fighting force. And at times when he went against the Persians, I believe he was opposed by an army of close to 600,000. So you think about what he achieved in six years. That, when it talks about in Daniel, that goat moved swiftly and its feet didn't touch the ground in Daniel 8. It's speaking of the Grecian Empire, and they truly did move with a speed that was unparalleled before in their history of how they worked through. These guys have been at it five to seven years, and they're conquering a range of about 50 miles wide, 150 miles long. Compare that. Just interesting, the difference. Of course, there was some improved technology by the time, Dan, by the time that Alexander rolls through, but interesting. So back to our chapter. He made war a long time with all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel. What does that mean? There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save or except the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. All others they took in battle. What does that mean? You know, it almost sounds like somehow they might have been granted it. Doesn't it? Well, then why didn't they make peace? Next verse. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle. None of them else had a soft enough heart to ask for it. Interesting. The Gibeonites had a soft enough heart to see what was coming and say, we're not going to survive unless we make peace with them. Try this on for size. Seeing the judgment of God coming, the Gibeonites fell upon the mercy of the Israelites. And they found it. Seeing the judgment of God coming in our lives, God woke us up to what we're doing, what it deserves. What did we do? By the grace of God, we threw ourselves in the mercy of God and asked for his forgiveness and received not only his mercy, but his grace. And we were made sons and daughters. Okay. Interestingly enough, well, Pastor Chris, this is, this is the dice are loaded here because he hardened their hearts. Yes, he did harden their hearts. Does that remind you of any world leader we studied before? Pharaoh. I believe it's 10 times Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then 10 more times God confirmed his hardness of his heart. Somebody once said, God never sets anyone up for destruction who has not long beforehand by their behavior and by their activities set themselves up first. So God is now confirming the rebellion, the ungodliness of these Canaanites. He is now confirming them in it and bringing that judgment against them. Question, what happens when our country becomes completely intolerant? A believer's repentance and salvation in Jesus. Where does that leave America? How are Christians received today, true born again Christians, not churchianity, true Christians, how are they truly handled and received generally by the media? Think about it. How about nut job, extremist, 
you know, um, intolerant, bigamist, etc. Anyway, interesting. Well, so they made a long war. Not a city made peace, for it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle. They might destroy them utterly, that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. Again, they had 400 plus years, 470 years before this judgment came. At that time, Joshua cut off the Anakims. Who are they? From the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, from all the mountains of Judah. Remember when the spies went through and Joshua and Caleb said, we can do this. And the 10 spies said, no way, because there were giants in the land. That was the Anakims. So now they go through and handle them. Not a problem. They were all worried about these guys and they're just mowing them down. Mountains of Judah from all the mountains of Israel, Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, except only in Gaza. Anybody want to name its famous son? Goliath, the biddies and I went through that. They were like, oh, he cut his head off? Oh, really? I'm like, yeah, really. Gaza and Gath and in Ashdod there remained. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had given to Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel and according to the divisions by their tribes. And the land rested from war. Now, Joshua took the whole land, yes, but there are still pockets that need to be subdued. Everybody got that? They have control of the land. They're able to freely move through it now, but there still are some hot spots. And we'll see that as we work through Joshua here. There will still be some ensuing battles. But the general moving work here, the southern part of the area of Canaan has been dominated. Now the northern main kingdoms and outposts have been dominated and brought under Israeli control. And so now they'll divide the land, begin to spread out, take control of the land, and they'll begin to occupy or to take over the land God gave to them. Interestingly enough, God had told them, I'm not going to drive them all out at once. Remember that? I'm going to do it little by little so that the wild animals don't take over. The land doesn't get out of control. Back in Exodus 23, 29, I won't do it right away, little by little, that the beasts don't multiply against you. And so I'll take it out until you've increased and you inherit the land. So chapter 12. And again, you know, what a difference. Joshua, faithful, 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 faithful to what God gave him to do. Think about when God asked Saul to wipe out the Amalekites. Remember that? Okay, Saul, look, you've been on the ropes. You haven't really been doing what God asked. Here's a chance to redeem yourself. Go to the Amalekites. They attacked Israel when they were coming out from Egypt. They attacked them in the rear part. They, they were un, unfair to how they handled Israel. And so it's time to deal with them. Interesting, Amalek is a type of the flesh. And so Saul went and they attacked them and they spared Agag the king. And rather than destroying everything that was supposed to be under a ban, they kept cattle and sheep and spoil. And Samuel had to finally come and rebuke him. And, and interesting, the difference the lack of obedience. Interesting study to go look at. So chapter 12. Now these are the kings of the land, which the children of Israel smote and possessed their land on the other side of the Jordan. So here's a little review for you. Toward the rising of the sun, facing east, from the river Arnon. Now, here's the river Arnon. We can drop down the lights a little bit here. Uh, is that Arnon? Yeah, I was going to say, hang on, try this map. That one's easier. Here's Arnon. Okay, so here's Reuben, Gad, Manasseh. So when I read through now, you can look at these areas and see what we're talking about. I'm okay. You can leave it down a little bit for them. From the river Arnon unto Mount Hermon, up in this area north, up to Mount Hermon. Is he going to do this the whole chapter? No, hang on. Plain of all the east, Sihon, king of the Amorites. Does this have Amorite territory? All right, let me flip back for a second. Here's Amorites, Ammon, Gilead, Bashan. Everybody got that? You're going to hear these names. Ammon, Gilead, Bashan. Here's Edri, Ashtaroth, these other names. Great. Now you can watch this. Just trying to help. Just trying to keep you all awake. Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, ruled from Aroar, which is upon the bank of the river Arnon, from the middle of the river, from the half Gilead, Unto the river Jabbok, where Jacob wrestled, under the border of the children of Ammon, from the plain of the Sea of Chinneroth, which you now know as the Sea of Galilee, on the east, under the Sea of the Plain, even the Salt Sea, or Dead Sea, on the east, the way to Beth Jeshimoth. From the south, under Ashtoth Pisgah, near where Moses would look out, Mount Pisgah area, the coast of Og, 
territory of Og, king of Bashan, which you know I showed you, which was of the remnant of the giants that dwelled at Ashtaroth and Edri, which I showed you near the rivers, and reigned in Mount Hermon and in Salca and Bashan under the border of the Geshurites and of the Machathites and half Gilead, which I showed you, the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. Them did Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel smite. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave it for a possession unto the Reubenites, you can see it up on the screen, unto the Gadites above them, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. These are the kings of the country which Joshua and the children of Israel smote on this side of Jordan on the west, from Balgad in the valley of Lebanon, even on the Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir down in the south, which Joshua gave unto the tribes of Israel for a possession according to their divisions. In the mountains and in the valleys and in the plains and in the springs and in the wilderness and in the south country, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, the king of Jericho, one. Uh, this gets a little easier now. Jericho, Gilgal, I, Beth El, Beth Shemesh, down to Debir, Hebron, Gaza. Okay, this area. And then we're going to go up north going this way. Here's Jerusalem, just for point of origin. Here is Bethlehem. Here is Gibeah, where Saul would be. Now you're going to hear me read about those. Again, here are their tribal regions. Jericho, which is one, king of Ai, which is beside it, Bethel, one, king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, and here's the pattern they work through, that lower arrow, king of Jarmuth, one, king of Laish, one, king of Eglon, one, king of Gezer, one, king of Debir, one, king of Gedir, one, king of Hormah, one, king of Arad, one, king of Libna, one, Abdullam, one, Makeda, one, Bethel, one, Tapur, one, Hefer, one, Aphek, one, Lashan, one, 19, Madon, one, uh, Hazor, one, 20, Shimron, Miran, one, Aksaf, one, King of Tanakh, one, the King of Megiddo, one, we're moving up through the central plain now, King of Kadesh, one, King of Jochnin of Carmel, one, King of Dor and the coast of Dor, one, the King of the nations of Gilgal, one, the King of Tirzah, one, all kings, 30 and one, there. Again, about 150 miles long, north to south, about 50 miles wide. Now Joshua was old and stricken in years. And the Lord said unto him, Behold, you're old and stricken in years. Boy, that's just, that's harsh, isn't it? That's pretty rough when God's got to tell you you're old. Joshua. Yes, Lord. Joshua. Yes, Lord. Behold, thou art old. <laughs> Solid, Lord. <laughs> and stricken in years. Yeah, I know I need to work out a little more, but you don't have to, you don't have to bust on me for going out loud. He's getting older. Some say 100. There's some speculation. He was, I think, we think 45, a little older than Caleb. Caleb's now 85. They would put him about 90, maybe a little past that. So he, he's old. If you're here and you're 90, you've never looked younger to us, but we're just repeating what we've heard here in our text. You know, long ago, Joe Foch, I think when he turned 50, was everybody saying, hey, you're middle age, you know? And he said, boy, I'd feel a lot better if I met a lot more 100-year-olds. I don't think I'm middle-aged, but anyway. You know, I think, is the average lifespan you actuary people still 78 for males? Or is it going up beyond that? Is it higher now? It's time to get new term insurance. Well, that's interesting. I could have saved 15% or more if I call Geico, you know? <laughs> Just kidding. I hope it's higher than that because at 46, I'm, I'm, if it is 78, I'm more than middle age. How's that for a reminder? Anyway, you're old, stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. <laughs> you can see Joshua going, hi. They're like, Find a young pup, would you, Lord? Because this is the land that yet remaineth, all the borders of the Philistines. Question, did they wipe them out? How many have read their Old Testament? All right, yeah, no, they sure didn't. That's a job that somebody forgot to finish. And all of Geshuri, from Sihor, which is before Egypt, south, under the borders of Ekron, north, which is counted to the Canaanite, the five lords of the Philistines, the Gazathites, the Astadites, the Escalonites, the Gittites, 
the Ekronites, and the Avites. And by the way, when we went through the Ark of the Covenant being stolen, did I tell you this last week? Sharing it with the biddies and they get emrods on their secrets. Biddies are like, sorry, these cities come up and I just still have this little visual of little biddies like, you know, just making these. Well, it got the attention of the Philistines. I mean, obviously they knew something was wrong, so. From the south, all the land of the Canaanites, Mira, which is beside the Sidonians, unto Aphek, unto the borders of the Amorites. From the land of Gibeonites, and all Lebanon, toward the sun rising from Balgad, under Mount Hermon again, unto the entering of Hamath. All the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon are the Misroth, Maim, all the Sidonians, again north, them will I drive out from before the children of Israel. However, only now I want you to divide the land by lot. Why would God want Joshua to divide the land before he dies? Why would he be the one to do it? Why not just let whoever's next in line do it? Number one, he's faithful. But number two, what does he have among the people that nobody else does at this point? Respect. Remember when they crossed the Jordan, God said to him, this day will I begin to magnify you in the eyes of the peoples I magnified Moses. He's really the right man to finish this job. So even though there's still land to be conquered, Joshua really is one of the few that the people would trust, I think, truthfully, human nature is human nature, to rightly divide the land so that no one would argue with the portions or give, well, the Danites will complain and some others, but we'll get into that. And he'll tell them, we'll stop whining and go conquer. But we'll get into that later. So Joshua's going to be the one. Now, some historians tell us, some rabbinical tradition says that the way they did this is they set out two urns. The names of the nine and a half tribes who had yet to get pieces of ground in one, and in the other, the various districts of the country that they had surveyed and divided into portions. Now remember, though, God had told them when you divide the land, the larger tribes should get a larger piece, smaller tribes should get a smaller piece. And so I don't, I don't know exactly how they worked it out. We'll find out one day when we get in heaven. But apparently they would go and they would go to one urn, pick a tribe, say Benjamin, pick a territory, here it is. And then they, okay. This is your territory. Now, I don't know in the case, for example, of Judah, a large tribe, or Ephraim, if they would, when they pick the area, say, okay, well, since it's large, we're going to give you a little bigger portion. You guys right next to him, like Benjamin, you're smaller, so we're going to encroach on yours a little bit. But somehow they worked out the exact process. What's interesting is, if you think about it, if it is two urns, and they're each one drawn, one drawn, it's completely random, so to speak, that means that what would appear to us, you, you programming people, a random number generator or a random chance or throwing the dice for, for you casino folks, what appears to be a truly random event, God knew. As Proverbs, I believe, 16 says, the lot is cast in the lap, but again, every decision is of the Lord. What do I mean God knew? God took Moses up on Mount Pisgah and he showed him the land and he told them the areas of the land by the tribes. Even unto Dan, it said looking toward the north. And yet they've not entered the land. They've not conquered the land. They've not set up, if they did indeed use the urns, they've not set them up. They've not randomly drawn the names. They've not just suddenly assigned to them their portions. None of that has happened. And yet God already knows the outcome of what is essentially a random chance event where they pick tribe and location and assign. What are you getting at? Clearly, God knows everything. Even what to our limited finite mental capacity would say is a completely random, you know, sort of accident, random chance, you know, spaghetti on the wall event. God knew exactly how this chip would fall. And yet look at the human interaction of they had to make the pieces. Someone had to reach in, had to grab them. They probably, I don't know if they fingered around and picked one they liked or whatever it was, but consider all the variables involved with that selection process. And if it was some other process, again, still by some form of lot, it was given to them. I'm still not following you. When things happen in your life that seem to make absolutely no sense and you start telling God, where was he? And why didn't he look out for you? And how come he doesn't care about you? And all these other things. You need to back up and say, wait a second. If God knew the outcome of a random event like choosing the ground and who would get what portion and where they would be located, then how much more does God understand this current trial, nuisance, heartache issue that I'm dealing with? 
It's not that he doesn't care. It's not that he's not here listening to your prayers. If he hasn't answered your prayer yet, you've got several options. Not according to his will, you're wasting your time. B, according to his will, but clearly it's not time. Either because you're not ready or the circumstances to answer the prayer aren't in existence yet. For example, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, praying to work at Google would have been impossible. Praying to work at some other things that just recently... Praying to have, for example, whatever other thing that's been happening in the last five years would have been impossible. There are jobs created in the last five years that didn't exist 10 years ago. So where God puts you, sometimes the reason it hasn't happened yet is because what he intends to do with your life may not be in order yet. And the whole time we just moan at him like he's forgotten us. <laughs> you know, I wonder if that smoke comes up before it's done like... <laughs> And worse yet, the enemy shows up, the devil or some private minion under his authority, and begins to tell you, you know, God doesn't care for you. And you buy it every time. You're right, he doesn't care for me. He doesn't care. God, you care, Lord, we're sinking. (laughs) You laugh, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. So as we go through this, this book, just don't miss the fact that God's got it covered. There's so many things in prayer that I thought was the right way to go. That today I can say from a whole heart, thank you, God, you didn't listen to me. And I hope you forgot it. Because I was so out in left field on this one that it, it's, it's painful. It had to be painful even to listen to it. Wow, is he out on left field? <laughs> Cherubim, do you see this? Look how far out in left field he is. <laughs> thank God I see my son's righteousness on him because he's... <sighs> if you've been there, you can relate. So they divided the land. So I will, diver- I will drive out from before the children of Israel. By the way, God promised he would drive out the Philistines, and yet they weren't driven out. Whose fault was it? The Israelites, not God's. I will drive them out from before the children of Israel. Only divide thou it, verse 6, by lot unto the Israelites for an inheritance as I've commanded you. Now therefore divide this land for an inheritance only unto the nine tribes and the half-tribe Manasseh. In other words, since... Reuben, Gad, and half-tribe Manasseh have kept their end of the deal. They have come to fight and help deliver the land. They may keep their inheritance. They can stay. And so he divided it. With whom the Reubenites and the Gadites have received their inheritance, which Moses gave them, verse 8, beyond Jordan, eastward, even as Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. From Aroar, it's, here it's, there you go. From Aroar, that is upon the bank of the river Arnon, the city in the midst of the plain, unto all the plain of Mediba, unto Dibon, Dibon, all the cities of Sihon, king of the Amorites, which reigned in Heshbon, or the border of the children of Ammon, the Gilead, and the border of the Geshurites, and Machathites. Interesting. They don't wipe out the Geshurites and the Machathites. A certain king will marry a woman. I believe Talmi was her father's name, the king. And he has a son with this woman who causes him a whole lot of trouble. Who is the son? Who is the king? David is the king. Who is the son? Absalom. And when Absalom flees, he flees back to this region. So don't forget those names. You're going to need them in Samuel. 2 Samuel 3.3, you can find out about that marriage, I believe, there. And then work your way through, I think, chapter 13 is when Absalom comes in and does his thing until his hair catches him. But if you don't know that story, go read it. (laughs) Anyway. The all of Mount Hermon, under Bashan, under Salka, and the children of Og and Bashan, which reigned in Ashtaroth and Edri, which you saw by those rivers in the previous slide, who remained with the remnant of the giants, for these did Moses smite and cast them out. Nevertheless, and this is not a good sign, the children of Israel expelled not the Geshurites nor the Machathites, we'll get Absalom from it, but the Geshurites and the Machathites dwell among Israel unto this day. Not a good sign. I wonder what our testimony is like. God gave, you know, Jim, whatever, Schmidt, great power from the Holy Spirit, great opportunities to serve him. Nevertheless, unfortunately, Jim could not put down, fill in the blank. I sure hope that's not our testimony. God gave Chris great opportunities Nevertheless, he couldn't put down anger, unforgiveness, drunkenness, drug use, pornography, etc., etc., etc. Nevertheless, they didn't expel the area of Geshurites. We need to drive out the old man 
and let the new man take over in Christ. Ephesians 4. Only the tribe of Levi, he gave none inheritance, as he told them back in Numbers 18, I believe. The sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritance, as he said unto them, and the Lord is. Moses gave unto the tribe of the children of Reuben the inheritance among their families, and the, their coast was from Aroar, in case you forgot the last two times, it's on the bank of the river Arnon, city that is in the midst of the river, and all the plain of Mediba, Heshbon, and all her cities. They're in the plain of Dibon, and Baal, Balmoth, Baal, and Beth, Baal, Meon, and Jah- Jahaza, and Kedemoth, and Methath, and to Kirjath Aim, and to Sibma, and to Zareth Shahar, and the Mount of the Valley, and to Beth Peor, and Ashdoth Pisgah, and unto Beth Jesimosh, and all the cities of the plain, and all the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites, which reigned in Heshbon, whom Moses smote with the princes of Midian, Evi, Rechem, and Zer, and Hur, and Reba, which were dukes of Sihon dwelling in the country. Balaam, remember him? Also the son of Beor. The soothsayer did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain by them. I wonder if the donkey survived, but that's another day. And the border of the children of Reuben was Jordan, and the border thereof was inheritance of the children of Reuben after their families, the cities and the villages thereof. And Moses gave inheritance unto the tribe of Gad, even unto the children of Gad, according to their families. And their coast was Jazer and all the cities of Gilead and the half of the land of the children of Ammon unto Aroar, which is before Rabbah. And from Heshemon unto Ramoth Mizpah and to Betoim, and from Mahaim unto the border of Debir, and the valley of Beth Aram unto Beth Nimrah, and Succoth and Zephon, and the rest of the kingdom of Sihon, king of Heshbon, Jordan, and his border, even unto the edge of the Sea of Chinnereth, which you know is the Sea of Galilee, on the other side of Jordan eastward. And this is the inheritance of the children of Gad, after their families, their cities, and their villages. And Moses gave inheritance unto the half tribe of Manasseh, and this was the possession of the half tribe of the children of Manasseh by their families. All the coast from Mahaim unto Bashan, from all the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, and all the towns of Jer, which are Bashan, threescore cities, sixty. And the half Gilead, Ashtaroth, Edri, and the cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan were pertaining unto the children of Machir, the son of Mas- Manasseh, even to the one half of the children of Machir by their families. These are the countries which Moses did distribute for an inheritance in the plains of Moab, on the other side of Jordan, by Jericho, eastward. But unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance, and the Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he said unto them. Now the Levites will get 48 towns with pasture lands and the offerings that come from the tabernacle and the temple. So God will provide for them. Question. God said he would give Israel this land promised to Abraham. Has he done it? Yes, he has. How long did it take? 400 years, 430 years till they left Egypt, 40 years of wandering, 470 total, another maybe five to seven in conquering, 470, almost 480 years. Took 480 years. And they still have some more to go. We'll get into that next week in dividing the land. It took a while. But God gave him what he promised. And when Jacob on his deathbed told Levi, God's going to scatter you in the land because of what you did to the area of Shechem with Simeon, your brother. That took even longer. Because now we're going all the way back to when they're before they're in Egypt, they're in Egypt. So we're looking at almost 500 years and change. And what Jacob promised on his deathbed has come to pass. When God says he's going to return, he's going to come to the Mount of Olives, he's going to establish his kingdom, he's going to gather all the nations, he's going to divide the sheep from the goats, it may take a while, but it's going to come to pass. This same Jesus, who you saw ascend up into heaven, will in like manner, bodily, coming with the clouds of heaven, to the Mount of Olives, return. The question is, when? Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and your mercy. Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that hasn't yet made peace with you, I pray their hearts wouldn't be hardened. 
but their hearts would be soft this evening. That they'd be willing just to ask you right where they stand to forgive them. The Gibeonites could see what was coming and they cried out for mercy. They did it in a strange way, but at least they obtained it. Rahab could see what was coming. Convicted by her own sin and the judgment against her city, humbled herself and cried out to God, and you heard her. Lord, if there's anyone here tonight, their sins are overwhelming them, and they realize they need to be forgiven. Give them the grace right where they stand to repent of their sin. Turn to you. Open their heart and ask you to come in and receive the salvation that is available to us through the wonderful name of Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.